Welcome to Scoop and Scale, where we dish up the science and weigh facts about mostly equine nutrition. I'm Jill Jackson, lifelong equestrian, podcast producer, and owner of Three Ponies. I'm a dressage rider and at-home horse keeper, living the challenge of managing three easy keepers on multiple acres of Iowa pasture. And I'm equine nutrition consultant, Dr. Claire Tunis of Clarity Equine Nutrition. I develop diet plans for horses ranging from metabolic seniors to Olympic athletes. I also consult for equine nutrition companies. I'm a scientist, dressage rider, and pony club mom. Claire and I have been horse friends for almost 20 years, and we've been collaborating on this podcast for the past year. And like most good horse friends, we're always talking horses. We're always talking about the challenges of managing our horses, our riding struggles, feeding horses, and what's going on in the wider equine community. This podcast is a place for us to have conversations mostly about equine nutrition. It's for anyone who wants to make better choices when it comes to feeding their horses. And before we get started, a quick disclaimer. The information in this podcast is general and not meant to replace the individualized advice of your own qualified equine nutritionist or veterinarian. And while I have a PhD in nutrition, I'm not a veterinarian and can't give medical advice. That, thank you for joining us and hope you enjoy the following episode. We're thrilled that everyone enjoyed part one with our guest, Dr. Phoebe Smith. In part one, we covered what ulcers are, how we diagnose them and treat them, and much more. If you missed that episode, I'd encourage you to go back and listen because Dr. Phoebe shared some really vital information that all horse owners should be aware of. Gastric ulcers are time-consuming and expensive to deal with, and I think any owner who's dealt with them is pretty motivated not to have them come back again. I know I certainly am. If you've been lucky enough to not have a horse with ulcers and so you haven't had to deal with them, hopefully we've convinced you that you don't want to deal with them. I get a lot of owners whose horses have been diagnosed with ulcers and they reach out to me for help. Today, Jill and I are going to continue the conversation and cover some of the preventative measures that you can take. And for those who maybe haven't listened to part one yet, can you do a quick review of how the stomach works? Yeah, absolutely. So to kind of go back over a little bit, the stomach really has two distinct parts, right? Think of it being shaped like a kidney bean. And we have the upper portion, which is the squamous portion, and the lower portion, which is called the glandular portion. And so the glandular portion secretes the stomach acid. And because it secretes stomach acid, it also secretes a number of compounds to protect it from the stomach acid. So The glandular tissue also secretes bicarbonate, which is a buffer, and it secretes mucus. So the whole of that area is coated in mucus so that it can handle being submerged in acid 24 hours a day. The upper portion of the stomach, that squamous tissue, because it doesn't release acid, it also has no protective mechanisms. It doesn't have mucus. It doesn't have bicarbonate. So it really is at risk if it comes into contact with acid of becoming ulcerated. Like the acid should not really be up there. And if it is up there, it shouldn't be up there for any great length of time. The stomach is really designed so that the acid stays in the bottom portion. And I think as we've discussed in previous episodes, you know, horses evolve to eat 16, 18 hours a day, constant trickle feeders, constantly having large amounts of forage kind of coming in a little bit at a time and then passing out. And so the stomach works best when it's only partially full And in part, because that means then there's only food in that lower portion and and the stomach's role too is to kind of churn and kind of like further physically break down material that's been eaten. And so it needs space to do that. It needs some empty room. And again, if you're eating forage all the time, you're chewing. And when you're chewing, the horse is secreting saliva. So horses are kind of interesting. They're a little different from people. Like we secrete stomach acid in response to a meal, and then we stop secreting stomach acid. Horses, on the other hand, because they evolved eating such low nutritional value forages, they evolved eating pretty much all the time. And so their stomachs are primed for food all the time. And so they secrete acid all the time. And so there's this, you know, whether you're feeding them or not at this point, there's always acid being secreted. And in the horse's environment where they have unlimited access to forage, it's kind of a beautiful system, right? Because the horse is constantly chewing, constantly secreting saliva, which has a large amount of bicarbonate in it, which is a buffer. And so it's constantly buffering the constantly secreted stomach acid. And so it's this great system. And then we came along and said, ah, just kidding. We're going to meal feed you breakfast and dinner. 
because that's more convenient for our lifestyle. And we started feeding horses twice a day or three times a day, perhaps. And so now we have long periods of time where they don't have forage coming in. They're not chewing. So they're no longer constantly secreting saliva and constantly buffering that stomach acid. So you start to see how the way the stomach is supposed to work starts to get kind of discombobulated because it's not receiving food all the time the way we manage horses. And we kind of set them up for ulcers in that way. At least those acid splash ulcers that Dr. Phoebe talked about, those squamous ulcers, right, in the upper portion, which we discussed last time, really are due to acid splash. And those really are management. We kind of cause those. And sounds like feeding a lot of forage would be an important part of reducing ulcer risk. Yeah, true, for sure. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Right. I mean, that's how horses are designed to eat. I mean, if we think about how horses evolve, they evolved on the plains of North America eating low nutritional value forages. And because there wasn't a lot of nutritional value in them, they had to eat a lot of those forages. And so they really are designed to eat forage and 60% of our digestive tract volume is dedicated to the fermentation of forage, the hindgut, which comes later on from the stomach. They're really fermentation vats and are meant to eat a lot of forage. And as I mentioned, the beauty of forage is it takes a lot of chewing. So think about hay, think about a grazing horse in a field. There's a lot of chewing going on and that chewing causes a lot of saliva secretion. And so, yeah, forage is key to managing ulcers. Well, I'm talking about the saliva when you think about like I feed a pound of alfalfa before I ride. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the pan when there's nothing else in it and there's just that they've eaten the alfalfa pellets, I mean, there's so much saliva in the bottom of the pan after they eat it. I mean, that's like a great, if you ever want to do a little project, you can see how much saliva comes out. Give your horse a little bit of something in the pan and watch because it really is amazing how much saliva ends up in the bottom of the pan once they're finished eating. Yeah, we used to do the same thing. My daughter's pony used to get alfalfa pellets. We would arrive at the barn and feed some before we rode. And yeah, same thing. The bucket would just be, I mean, Gross. a lot of saliva. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm foamy, bubbly, yeah, and he'd just be green slime everywhere. But yeah, so they're secreting, you know, when they're chewing forage, they're secreting a lot of saliva. The other thing that forage does is it creates a fiber mat in the stomach. So I like to kind Kind of like relate this to think about like a natural fiber doormat that you might have. Think of that like floating on top of liquid, right? So you think about your stomach, all the acid is at the bottom two thirds of the stomach. And then you've got this nice flat mat of fiber floating on the top. In reality, it's all kind of mixed in, but there is a lot of fiber floating on the top of that acid. And it helps to stop that acid splash because it creates a nice thick physical barrier that keeps that acid down where it's supposed to be and stops it splashing up. And small particle sized feeds just don't do that the same way. And if you have no feed in the stomach, then that's certainly not happening. Especially if you're trotting around. I mean, if you hop on and you go trotting around and then you're like splash, splash, splash. <laughs> Yeah. And we know, and think about it, we know that the acid is more acidic the further down you go. The bottom of the stomach is more acidic than the top. And if you start, that starts splashing around and mixing. Now you've got, instead of the stuff on the top that's just floating on the top, being in contact with that unprotected tissue, now you've got that super acidic stuff mixing and churning up through and splashing about. You know, If you don't have that fiber in there to stop that from happening, you're really increasing your ulcer risk. So the fiber mat is really important. The saliva is a really big portion of the forest. So yeah, forage is a really important part of ulcer management, especially those squamous ulcers. And that's what you're saying was that keeping forage in front of your horse all the time, but slow feeders would be perfect for this. And I think that a lot of times owners think about slow feeders when they're dealing with ponies or horses that are overweight to try to reduce their intake. But really, I mean, it's great just to slow them down so they have their hay last them longer. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and that's the thing. Like if you're not somebody, because you hear this all the time, right? It's like, well, I know I should should be feeding enough forage that my horse has forage in front of it all the time. But there's a number of reasons why that may not be realistic. To your point, maybe a horse wouldn't be able to manage its weight correctly if it had completely unlimited access to all the hay it could eat. Secondly, you know, let's be real, many people are in boarding facilities where you're just not allowed unlimited forage, right? A lot of facilities are like you can have up to so many flakes per day or you know what have you, and that's beyond that. You either buy your own or it just isn't a thing. So using the slow feed nets is a really great way of making a restricted amount of forage last a lot longer longer. And years ago, I used to, there was a Haynet brand that I used to keep a few of and sell every now and again to clients if they wanted one. And I was at a dressage camp and had given a nutrition talk and I had some of these nets and, and people, I think four people bought them. And the instructions
suggestions that come with most hay nets are don't go cold turkey, don't put all your horse's hay in the net, because you can really make a horse pretty angry if all of a sudden what was loose hay on the ground is now stuck in a net with a one-inch hole. A lot of horses can get pretty cross about that, and then they'll rip at the nets and, and break them. Of course, the reality is, is very few people actually follow that advice. <laughs> so all the people that bought the nets just put their evening meal in the net and hung it up. But what was kind of cool about that was is that I checked on them all about 10 o'clock at night before I went to bed, and all the horses that had nets still had hay in their nets. All the horses that were fed on the ground had no hay left. And I purposely got up early. I knew what time everyone was feeding the next morning, and I got up earlier. And those horses that had nets still had a tiny amount of hay left in the net, which told me that they could have eaten that if they'd wanted to. They had just sort of chosen not to, and they'd obviously felt satiated all night, and they had had the option to eat forage all night had they wanted to. So yeah, slow hold hay nets are a really great way of making the hay you're already feeding last longer. Because ideally, you don't want there to be more than six hour window without food in front of your horse, because that's about how long it takes the stomach to empty. And just to chime in about the hay nets, you don't have to get an ultra slow feeder. If your horse doesn't have a weight issue, I mean, you could easily get a one and a half inch. They go as low now, I think, as a half an inch and then an inch. I have ponies, so I have teeny tiny little whole nets. But any type of a net is going to work to slow them down if they're not used to eating it. It's still going to help lengthen the time that they're going to get to eat. So you don't have to get the ultra slow. Yeah, and I know people worry about nets and neck positions and hanging them up and then having them on the ground and feet getting caught in them. There are lots of ways that you can secure nets in a way to create a natural eating headset. So their heads are down in a way that they couldn't get their feet on the net, or at least they'd have to try really hard to get their feet on the net. I actually just saw a a great picture this week of somebody who was using one of those really large water uh, troughs and had put a bolt in the bottom of the trough and was snapping their net to the bottom of it with a carabiner. And those troughs are probably two feet high sides, the big ones. So yeah, could the horse put its foot in the trough? Of course it could. It's a horse. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. I'm never going to say never. But they would have to try pretty hard. But you could also use a hay ball and do, there's other enrichment options that would work also. And we're not going to get into the hay net discussion because we are talking about ulcers and the hay nets we would talk about for days and and days. We'll do an episode on slow feed. We'll do an episode on, (laughs) yeah. So moving on, does it matter what kind of forage you feed when when you talk about ulcers? Yeah, that's a really, it's a good question. So yes and no. I mean, on some level, just get forage in front of them, your hay of choice kind of thing. But we do know that alfalfa is a slightly better buffer because it's very high in calcium. So most of our legume hays are higher in calcium, higher in protein, and are going to buffer better. There was some research done at Texas A&M looking at feeding alfalfa versus, I think it was Bermuda hay. And they showed that the horses that were fed alfalfa their stomachs were buffered for longer than the ones that were fed grass hay. So it is a better buffer. You don't necessarily have to feed very much alfalfa. I think the recommendation that came out of that study was that as little as a pound of alfalfa can help buffer the stomach. So again, if you're sitting in that kind of like, well, you know, I have the overweight horse and I can't feed a lot of alfalfa because it's higher calorie, then feeding a small amount of alfalfa can be beneficial. Generally, I don't like to go above about 20 to 30% of the total hay as alfalfa anyway. When I do have alfalfa in the diet, because it's so high in calcium and protein, it just becomes hard to balance that. But yes, a little bit of alfalfa can help. But at the end of the day, any forage that's going to require chewing is going to be helpful. And obviously, the longer the stem of the forage, the more chewing is involved. So I know you mentioned you feed alfalfa pellets, and that's great. But obviously, some amount of alfalfa hay would take more chewing than the same amount of alfalfa pellets. But it can be hard if you're in a situation where you just want to feed a pound of alfalfa because of calorie issues or what have you, it's very hard to get a pound of alfalfa off a bale. And so it's easier sometimes to do that as pellets. So you can use the pellets for their buffering capacity as well. Does it matter when the forage gets fed? Yeah, I mean, I think I mentioned earlier, right, that the stomach empties about every six hours. It becomes empty after about six hours. So ideally, you would put hay in front of them sort of every six hours or so to try and mitigate that so the stomach isn't empty. I realize that's not feasible in a lot of barn boarding situations. People like sleep for some reason. (laughs) I'm sitting here feeling pretty tired, so I get that. But I like to feed the alfalfa. If I'm going to have some alfalfa in the diet, I generally feed it in the morning. I think there's a little bit of work showing that the stomach is a little more acidic in the morning than it is at the end of the afternoon. 
There's some recent research, though, suggesting that actually keeping hay in front of horses during the day may actually be more beneficial than keeping it in front of them at night uh, for long periods of time. So maybe don't feel so bad if you don't get out there to feed some hay late, late at night, because some of the, the most recent research suggests that actually having that constant hay throughout the daylight hours may actually be the most important time of day to have forage in front of them. While we're talking about feeds, I've seen online people looking for low starch feeds to feed their ulcer prone horses. Why would they want to avoid a high starch feed if the horse is prone to ulcers? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So the reason is, is there are actually bacteria in the stomach. We don't talk about bacterial fermentation in the stomach very often. That's normally saved for talking about the hindgut, which is where the massive population of bacteria are. But there are some bacteria in the stomach and they will very readily ferment starch. And just like in the hindgut, the byproducts of that fermentation are volatile fatty acids. And as the name suggests, they are acidic. And so that's going to result in some different kind of acid than the horse is producing naturally, but some acid nonetheless being produced, which will just then you know, create a more acidic environment overall in the stomach. So yes, we typically try to avoid feeding higher starch feeds when we have a horse that's prone to gastric ulcers. And you certainly get a lot of horse owners looking for help with diet changes or wanting to know if there's supplements they can use that will prevent ulcers. So what supplements do you recommend? Yeah, that's a tricky one. I think we have to reference back to Dr. Phoebe last time who said that, you know, she scoped thousands and thousands of horses that are being given pretty much every kind of supplement there is out there for gastric health and will find ulcers in those horses. So unfortunately, there really isn't anything out there that's an absolute magic bullet that will prevent ulcers in like every horse on the planet. Whoever figures that out is going to probably be pretty rich. <laughs> but there are some categories, you know, like there are supplements out there that may be helpful and they fall into a, so some, ca- I think of them in a number of categories. So I kind of class supplements into products that buffer, right, and help reduce the stomach acidity, products that coat the stomach and add protection from the acid that way. And then there are some others that kind of help, that claim to kind of provide nutrients and compounds that might help make the stomach lining more robust and better able to withstand erosion. So let's start with the buffers. What are they and how do they work? I think people are pretty familiar with the concept of buffers initially as a result of the research on alfalfa being effective for helping to reduce stomach acid because as I mentioned before, that's acting as a buffer because of the calcium in it. Buffering supplements have been around for a long time. I think most recently, one that's gotten a lot of publicity is Purina's Outlast. And that, you know, is interesting. They showed that that product has what's called marine derived calcium in it. So this is calcium that comes from a certain kind of red seaweed, and it has a really interesting structure. It kind of has like this very kind of almost looks like honeycomb type structure. And so it gives it a massive surface area. And so obviously the acid can kind of get into all of those crevices and stuff within those honeycomb structures within the calcium. It's also got a good amount of magnesium in it too, which also acts as a buffer. And it buffers stomach acid, you know, in their research that they did, it buffers stomach acid a little more quickly than alfalfa does and lasts a little longer than alfalfa does. But the thing with buffers is they don't last forever, right? Most buffers only buffer for a you know, couple hours maximum, like maybe, I think, you know, three or four, I think some of the research showed. So th- I think, unfortunately, some people have gotten into the thinking that they can add a buffer to their horse's breakfast and dinner, and then the horse is taken care of for 24 hours kind of thing. And unfortunately, they don't work that way. You're going to get buffering capacity for a handful of hours after you give that buffering supplement. So the way I like to use buffers is I'll use them before I ride. I'll use them before putting a horse in a trailer. I'll use them, you know, at competitions uh, where I might be around and able to keep giving it kind of over and over and over again. But I'm going to use it in situations where I want the stomach acid to be reduced for a couple of hours. But I'm not going to kid myself into thinking that this is going to lower the acidity of the stomach for a 24-hour period. They just don't work like that. And there are some others as well that work a little differently. So there's actually... We talked last time about sacrolfate, which is a medication. And sacrolfate actually increases bicarbonate production in the stomach. And as I mentioned before, bicarbonate is a buffer. So that is actually one of the actions of sacrolfate is to help with buffering capacity of the stomach. You mentioned coating agents. What are coating agents? 
<laughs> so these are compounds that like line the stomach lining and they're going to create a physical barrier. So some of the most basic ones you might find are like bentonite clay. So bentonite clay will dissolve in the stomach and, you know, coat the stomach lining. Other common ones that people might have seen, things like slippery elm and milk thistle. Those are obviously like you know, slippery elm, as the name suggests, is sort of a slimy compound that just kind of coats the lining of the stomach. It's kind of like, think about mucus. It's like a fake mucus kind of thing. Marshmallow root kind of acts in a similar way. There are some sort of aluminum compounds. This is a big mouthful. Dihydroxy aluminum sodium carbonate <laughs> and aluminum phosphate. You'll see those as ingredients in some horse supplements. Those are coating agents that, again, create a barrier, a protective barrier, sealing the lining of the stomach. Again, sacrolfate, because it forms a gel and thus a physical barrier between the gut contents and the gut lining. And so it helps to protect the gut lining from the acid. And yeah, it's kind of an interesting, it also, interestingly, sacrolfate also increases mucus production. And so that's going to help it prevent the breakdown of mucus in the stomach and help kind of replenish the mucus that the, the stomach's already producing. So that's a really, you know, again, people use sacrolfate preventatively when they go to competitions. And that's a kind of why it gets used sometimes a preventative while they're competing. We had a listener question about giving sacrolfate because in our last episode, Dr. Phoebe mentioned that it can be given with food. However, our listener contacted us and said that they've been told that it had to be given on an empty stomach. Can you clarify that? Yeah, so it's definitely, you know, there's definitely some differing. I hear that as well, right? People say, well, I was told this and I was told that. So because I'm not a vet, I reached out to Dr. Phoebe and asked her to clarify. And this is the response that she sent me. So no, sacrolfate does not require an empty stomach like Gastrogard does. Several years ago, it was thought that an empty stomach was required for adequate absorption of sacrolfate, but this is not current information. So the protocol usually goes something like this. 6 a.m. Gastrogard, 7 a.m. feed hay, 7.30 to 8 a.m. give sacrolfate plus or minus hard feed. So that would be your grain if you give any. 6 p.m. hay plus second dose of sacrolfate plus or minus any hard feed or grain that you give. She went on to say there is no research to my knowledge looking at preventative use of sacrolfate. However, she does recommend using sacrolfate and gastrograd preventatively when traveling or showing for horses that have been diagnosed with glandular ulcers in the past. So appreciate Dr. Phoebe weighing in on that listener question with us for us. Hey. I'm going to say, thanks, Dr. Phoebe, again. <laughs> right? So, so yeah. And the- I know a lot of people do use sacrolfate at shows. I know I use it. I do use it in conjunction with Gastrogard, as she suggests. So it, it's a pretty commonly used thing for horses that have previously been diagnosed for ulcers. And it's kind of a relief that it doesn't have to be given in food. I actually went away to try and find out where that latest information may have come from. And there's actually a consensus statement on equine glandular gastric ulcer disease and that came out in 2018 that was put together by the, I'm going to get this wrong now, it's like the European College of Internal Veterinary Medicine Specialists or something like that. And a panel of the, I think it's about eight to 10 leading global researchers on equine gastric ulcers got together and came up with a consensus agreement on how best to treat and how best to manage different kinds of gastric ulcers. And in there, it actually states that sacrolfate can be given with feed, but that gastrogard should be given on empty stomach. So for those that are wondering where that's come from, that is, I think, where Dr. Phoebe has has got that up-to-date information from. And just for anybody that has not ever used sacrolfate or gastrogard, and luckily they've had a horse that has never had ulcers, both gastrogard and sacrolfate are prescription only. And that ulcer is correct. guard is you can buy at the store or your feed store, you can get ulcer guard. But if you do want or think you need first scope, because scoping is always the answer, but both gastrogard and sacrolfate need to be prescription from the vet. They are. And I think that's really important to understand because so ulcer guard is what we're generally going to be using to for prevention when we're going to a show, right? Because you can go pick that up at your feed store. 
when you look at Olsagard, it's the exact same thing. The contents are exactly the same as a tube of Gastrogard. The instructions on a tube of Olsagard are going to tell you to give a quarter tube to an average size horse as a preventive dose. I know from conversations with Dr. Phoebe that she will often recommend giving an entire tube of Olsagard, especially for those horses that are really at risk. And I think it's also worth adding that, again, that needs to be given on an empty stomach. And you need to start it several days before you go to your show, right? So this is not something that you say the morning of your show, oh, we're going to a show today, and you start giving all cigars and you start giving it while you're at your show. You actually, it takes a couple of days to take effect and for the acid suppression effect of that medication to actually be fully effective. So you really need to start giving it like two to three days before you're going to be leaving to go to your show. And, you know, I know sometimes people will give it for a couple of days on the back end as well once they get home. So you can do your math and figure out how many tubes you're going to need beforehand. One more disclosure. We are not veterinarians. So please consult your veterinarian before giving your horse a dose of anything. Exactly. Absolutely. (laughs) Moving on. Back to coating agents. Are there any other coating agents that we did not discuss? Yeah, I think people use aloe quite frequently. And aloe is kind of interesting. There is like, to my knowledge, like one research paper that might show some efficacy of aloe. I know from, you know, formulating products and looking at putting aloe in them that there's differing qualities of aloe and they're not all made the same. So I hate to say it, but the kind of aloe gel that you're probably buying at your big box stores and gallon jugs is not very good quality and likely isn't really going to be doing you a whole lot of good because the the effective part of the aloe is actually like the carbohydrate fractions in that aloe. And actually aloe biggest effect is actually working as a prebiotic. And it's those carbohydrate fractions in there that are doing that. And the way that it's processed, many of those are not going to be in that big box store cheap aloe gel. So if you're going to use aloe, you need to find something that's a higher quality. And then there's another one, there's an interesting ingredient called apolectol. And this has actually been shown to increase the total mucus concentration in your stomach juice for up to a period of five hours. And it's a combination of pectin and lecithin that's been kind of mixed together to make this product called apolectol. So you might see that ingredient in certain products. And again, it it does last for about five hours. But as I mentioned before, these coating agents, these buffers, they don't last all day, unfortunately. Are there supplements or ingredients that work in other ways than what we've already discussed? Are we missing something? Yeah, I mean, there are those things that help the stomach supposedly kind of rebuild itself, right? So like glutamine comes to mind. It's the most abundant amino acid in plasma and it plays an important role in maintaining the integrity of your intestinal barrier. So that's why you'll often see glutamine included in stomach and GI tract supplements. There's a form of zinc called zinc methionine. It's an amino acid complex. And there was some interesting research done looking at it and gastric ulcers. And they found that when you give that zinc versus giving zinc sulfate, that seemed to reduce the incidences of gastric ulcers in horses. So that work, again, was done in horses, which is nice. Collagen. Collagen is another one, which is collagen is a building block for maintaining and repairing your intestine. It's also really important for immune function. And there was actually some research done in some broodmares that had very severe stomach ulcers, and they'd previously been used as embryo recipients in another study. And then they were put into this ulcer study. And so they were kept in individual stalls and exercised, fed free choice hay, so as much hay as they wanted. And about half the horses were given this product that had collagen in it. And after four weeks, they were scoped and the ulcers had decreased. Interesting in both groups. And the ulcers had healed in half the horses. And there was no difference between horses that had received the supplement and those that had not. So you see collagen in products, but it may or may not be effective. They did find that severe stomach ulcers did improve with the ad-lib forage. So they, they found that the use of frequent forage was seen to be more effective than the inclusion of the collagen. So, And they did actually, I should say that in that study, they did actually give the vet, actually recommended that those horses should be given omeprazole because they, gastrogard, because they did have severe ulcers. But there, again, there was no improvement in the healing between the ones that were given the collagen and not, and they were all given gastrogard. So really, the collagen didn't seem to have any additional benefit. 
Another ingredient we see very frequently in some popular gastric products is hyaluronic acid. And this is, you know, again, it's known to be important for sort of the epithelial tissue, the tissue that lines the the digestive tract. The, the issue with hyaluronic acid is, is that it has to be the right size molecule. So hyaluronic acid can come as a small molecule, a large molecule, and the research seems to be kind of conflicting. So there was a A study called The Role of Hyaluronin Treatment in Intestinal Innate Host Defense that was published in 2020. And in that study, it said hyaluronic acid needed to have a small molecular size so that it was able to actually bind with the gut lining and have an effect. But then there was another study that looked at using it in horses called Polysaccharide Treatment Reduces Gastric Ulceration in Active Horses, published in 2017. And they specifically use large size hyaluronic acid. So, and they did find a benefit of using hyaluronic acid. For me, I feel like the research is kind of conflicting. The study that was done was not really a super controlled study because it was, the horses were not in a controlled environment. They were in their home barns. And so I think there was different management between the horses, as far as I recall. The hyaluronic acid thing, I'm kind of like, yeah, I, I feel like the jury's still a bit out on that. Needs a bit more work. And then the other thing that we see quite often in gastric products is beta-glucans. And those come a lot of times from carbo- various carbohydrate sources. They might come from oats, different grains. They might come from mushrooms. There is actually a source of an algal-based source of beta-glucans. And beta-glucans are important because they help initiate an immune response. So they help the body know that something needs healing, something needs doing. So that's kind of why they're in in gut health products. And there's lots of other ones, but these are just some of the main ones that I'm seeing in products currently. We heard last time that glandular gastric ulcers can be particularly hard to clear up. Is there anything specifically for them that can help? It's tricky, right? Because I think we said last time, we don't really understand the underlying sort of pathophysiology with glandular ulcers. It's not quite like squamous ulcers we know are sort of those acid splash ulcers. You know, what we do know is that, so data suggests that fiber affects the efficacy of the drugs used for treatment for glandular ulcers. So that's an important consideration. And horses with a history of glandular disease and those that tend to be high risk, there, there are some things out there that have been researched specifically for this kind of ulcers. So for example, the addition of oil and some mucosal protectants may be beneficial. So KER or Kentucky Equine Research, they have an oil called Resolvin. It actually, they look specifically at squamous ulcers, but I'll be curious to see if they do any work looking at glandular ulcers, but that's kind of a unique oil. It's a combination of fish oil and some safflower oil. And safflower oil is kind of interesting because it has an omega-6 fat in it that behaves like an omega-3. And they hypothesize that there's something specific about that fat and how it influences what are called prostaglandins in the stomach, that it might be beneficial for ulcers. And it certainly seemed to be the case for squamous ulcers. And given that we know that oils can be beneficial for glandular ulcers, it's possible that that oil might also help those ulcers. Supplementing pectin and lecithin complexes has been shown to be of benefit to some small number of horses. Beet pulp is really high in pectin. So there's you know, some suggestion that feeding a small amount of beet pulp to some of these horses might be helpful and it might be a less expensive alternative to some of the most of the supplements out there that have enough pectin in them to really be beneficial are pretty expensive, right? They have the kind of proprietary pectin less of them products. So, you know, if you're on a budget and those are not in your reality, feeding some beet pulp might be beneficial or using feeds that have beet pulp in them might be beneficial. But, you know, again, there's no real data to really back that up as far as specifically beet pulp. There's something else called diglycerized licorice. And there was some work showing that that can be beneficial for glandular ulcers. Again, we're talking about one study for many of these ingredients with a very limited number of horses in there. But yeah, diglycerized licorice specifically for glandular ulcers. And you'll see that in products. And sea buckthorn. So sea buckthorn berries are a really interesting berry. They're bright orange and they're grown in the Himalayas. 
and other mountainous regions. And they have a really interesting omega fat that's an omega-7, which nobody's ever heard of, right? Nobody ever talks about (laughs) omega-7. But interestingly, there was some work done on Seabuck looking at gastric ulcers in the horse. And it didn't appear that it had a major effect on squamous ulcers, but interestingly, it did appear to help with glandular ulcers, which is like the opposite of everything else. Most things help with squamous ulcers and don't seem to help with glandular ulcers. But the Seabuck thorn did, and, and specifically the product that was researched was called Seabuck 7. And then I think it's worth mentioning that there is a little bit of research in the UK about feeding very stemmy chopped forages. So I mean, I grew up in England and we used to feed what we called chaff all the time, right? Which is chopped hay or chopped straw. And there was some work there showing that feeding very stemmy chopped forages may exacerbate glandular ulcers. So it's not always safe to extrapolate research to other things, but it does make sense that if you have a super stemmy hay and it has to go out of that pylorus and the hard ends of the hay are poking into that pylorus as it's leaving, that you could have some physical mechanical damage happening there. So it may be worth, if you have a horse that's struggling with glandular ulcers, it may be worth trying to find hays that are a little softer and less stemmy if you're feeding a stemmy hay. In the last episode, Dr. Phoebe mentioned how crucial management is. And I think we're all guilty. You know, we've all walked through the barn and been like, oh, he's just grumpy or they can just be quirky. Like what should barn owners and managers, like what should they be looking for in those horses instead of just saying it's the normal? Yeah, I mean, I think we do pass it off as normal, right? I was in a barn not that long ago in Virginia looking at a horse who you know, was struggling with some weight management, was not a bit super thrifty. You know, we talked about all kinds of things that might be contributing to that. And we were looking at the horse standing outside at the end of the barn aisle, nice sunny day, standing out on the grass. The horse is pretty relaxed. They went to lead it back in and it they walked up the barn aisle. It's one of those lovely old barns in Virginia with the stalls, you know, the hay barn over the top or whatever. And they led the horse down the aisle and turned right, put the horse in the second stall and took the halter off. And it immediately like lunged at the horse next door, even though it couldn't really see it. It could kind of see it faintly through gaps in the planks in the wood, right? And I said to her, I said, oh, does it always do that? And she said, oh, yeah, you know, it really doesn't like its neighbor. And I said, oh, well, could you find it a different neighbor? And she's like, well, it really doesn't like any neighbors. <laughs> and and I said, well, okay, you know, I get it. Could it possibly be put in the end stall so that it would only have a neighbor on one side, right? So that it could, if it wanted to get away from other horses, if it didn't want to be around other horses, it could stand up against the wall where there was no horse on the other side. And it could look out of the window and look out across the pastures and the paddocks and kind of have the long view and maybe pretend it was somewhere else if it wasn't feeling very happy. (laughs) And she, you know, she kind of looked at me and I just realized, you know, like they didn't see that behavior because they saw it every day. And to me, it was really dramatic because I was like, whoa, that horse is like lunging at the other horse and like, you know, ears back. And then they both kind of went at it through the wall. And, you know, my daughter's pony used to do the same thing, right? We used to have the opposite. We had very open pipe, mare motel type pens. And at feed time, you know, they can all see each other. And the massive mare next door, big 17-2 warm blood, would kind of like pin her ears and snaky face him, you know, from across her stall. And he would turn around and pin his ears and like buck at her. And I'm thinking, you know, there's a lot of stress happening right here, right? This is, there's always stress around feeding time and, you know, it's not healthy, it's not helpful, and it's certainly not going to help horses that are prone to ulcers. So yes, you're right. I think we we definitely take it for granted. And I think we definitely are guilty of saying, oh, that's just how it is and that it won't change. And you know, I'll just use my horse as an example of that. When I bought him in January, he was extremely girthy. Like I put a saddle on him, he actually bucked the first day I put a saddle on him. And if you girthed him up, he stomped his feet. Like you had to mind where your feet were because he would stomp his left front foot at you on the ground and pin his ears and try to bite you. He was miserable. You know, and I knew that he'd had a history of saddles that didn't fit very well. And I suspected that he maybe had ulcers. And sure enough, you know, down the road a little bit, I did have him scoped and he did have ulcers. But I also decided that, yes, this could be now a learned behavior, an anticipation of pain from the saddle or girthing or anticipation of discomfort when being ridden because of ulcers, and that it had become a habit. And so I decided to use positive reinforcement training and clicker training and actually did a little bit of something called Cat H training 
to basically change his perspective on that. And it started off with literally me in the round pen for 40 minutes, him loose, me standing with a saddle pad. And every time I stepped towards him with a saddle pad, if he pinned his ears at me, I stepped away. And we literally started off like that. Like, I see you. I see you're unhappy about this. I'll back off. And we just kind of built from that. And now he'll stand calmly to be saddled and we don't have any of that behavior. In fact, we did get some of that behavior while at the show last weekend, which I thought was very interesting. So it told me that actually he was a little stressed out by being at that show. And, you know, it was maybe feeling a little bit of gastric tension or something was going on that was making him a little unhappy. So, yes, it can be a behavior, it can be a habit, but I'd also challenge people that you can take the time to train them to learn a new behavior. And then that can become very useful to you because if the behavior starts to creep back in, you can use it as an indicator that all is not okay with that horse. Those are all really good points. I think that's really, I think it's something that we just don't think about because we just assume it's normal. And there, you can make simple changes or, add, you know, if you're at a boarding facility, maybe there is an empty stall coming up or maybe you can try moving with somebody else. If it's going to make your horse happier, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But at least you tried something new. Totally. Yep. Are there any other management, environmental things that we know can cause stress that might lead to ulcers? I mean, there's lots, right? I mean, everything from the weather to trailering, you know, all those kinds of things. And there's a huge long list of even the vet and the farrier coming out for some horses is enough stress to cause problems. But You know, I do think trailering is a big one, right? I mean, always have forage available in a trailer so that they can eat while they're on the trailer. Don't put them in the trailer on an empty stomach. I think that's important. Similarly, don't ride on an empty stomach. That can be tricky. I know the barn that, you know, our horses are now at a barn where they're out grazing all day, so I don't have to worry about this so much. But at our previous barn, you know, they got breakfast and dinner and we would show up to ride after school about an hour before dinner time when they hadn't eaten since breakfast. And so we always fed them hay before they got ridden because we didn't want to ride on an empty stomach because of that fiber mat and the chewing and the acid splash we talked about at the beginning of the episode. Riding less often. I think Dr. Phoebe mentioned that last time, giving them two back-to-back days off. I know that can be tricky uh, for some people to wrap their head around, but giving them time, you know, two days off a week, Jill, I'm looking at you because I know you like to ride your pony. (laughs) I know. I'm working on it. I'm working on doing two back-to-back. It's hard enough to do two days. It's even harder to do two back-to-back days if not riding. Anyway, I'm trying. I know. Or at least not heavy training, right? I mean, I don't know, but I I mean, I wonder whether tack walking, getting on hacking out on the buckle kind of thing might be okay, but certainly not too easy, easy days. If you're determined to sit in that saddle, make it super easy work. You know, and then, you know, things that, again, you may not have a lot of control over in your barn, but maybe you do. The number of people handling your horse, right? So there are some barns that have different people that feed in the morning, different people that feed in the evening, different people on the weekends, you know, like that can be an issue. And and not everybody, as we know, different horses behave differently around different people and different people have different vibes around horses. And horses are sensitive, right? They're, they're a flight animal. They're very very expensive. They are very expensive. That was an interesting <laughs> slip there. Horses are really expensive. We all know that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but they, especially if they have ulcers, but they're very sensitive to who's handling them and, and people around them. And so, you know, maybe if you have a horse that's prone to ulcers, maybe there's a way to lessen the number of people handling that horse might be beneficial. And then one that people don't think about and I get all the time is like playing music in the barn, right? There's research showing that horses are less stressed when they play classical music music than when they're played, you know, it's like heavy rock or whatever. And so what your barn staff are playing in the barn every day may be impacting your horse's well-being in ways you don't realize. I'd like to talk about this for a second. I am the barn staff and therefore (laughs) I get to pick the music. My sport pony's from Montana and he loves country music and I'm not listening to country music. It's not for me. And he hates, like I put on the top 40 and he hates it. You put the country music on and he's a Welsh or he's half Welsh and he gets his little Welshy ears and he's all like cute and his ears are pricked up and he loves it. And then I'm like, no, we're not listening to this. You know, like I'm scanning through the channels <laughs> trying to find something and it's like, I'm in Iowa. There's lots of country music. Keep going. 
We tried compromising on rock. He also does not like rock. He doesn't like top 40. He doesn't like rock. We are currently listening to 80s, which seems to be a compromise for both of us. <laughs> He's broadening your musical horizons. How do you know he doesn't like what he doesn't like? Just like when the radio comes on in the morning, like I shut the music off overnight so that they can yeah. sleep. And so like in the morning when I go out to do chores and feed, like I turn the music on and when the country music's on, like his little ears, like he's up and his little ears and they're pricked and he's so cute. And you're like, oh, look at you little Welshy pony. And then if it's, you know, top 40 and there's like dance music or whatever, he's just like, meh, doesn't even look. Kind of gives me like a side eye, like, I can't believe you have this on and then goes back and like looks the other way. <laughs> I should take a video of this. It's very funny how much he loves country music. That would be funny. I think talk radio can be hard too, right? I know, like, I think there was some... He doesn't want to listen to NBR. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, any of the talk radio, especially right now, is probably not a good idea. But yeah, so what you play on your radio station can influence your horse. So yeah, there's lots of little things. So I think the takeaway is really is really stand back, right? And look at your horse's environment and just you know, kind of like analyze it. Be in the moment, be present, take account of what's going on, what's happening. Yeah, stop, like, right? Yeah. And just, and look, and I remember my grandfather was a dairy farmer and and he was really big into that. He would just be like, I remember being four years old and standing, looking at some sheep over a gate. And he said, hark, as in be quiet. And I think I was four. And I saw I was standing there, I was really quiet. And I'm like, what granddad? And I said, I don't hear anything. And he was like, exactly. You know, but that was sort of his thing was he wanted to hear the sheep. He wanted to hear if anybody was making any noise, whether anything was wrong. You know, it's like we get to be so quick sometimes and just busy, busy, busy because we've got to get our chores done and get home and make dinner for the kids or get to work or do whatever that we sometimes don't see what's right in front of us. So I would just challenge everybody, even if your horse doesn't have ulcers, because maybe they do and we just don't know yet. (laughs) You know, just step back and take the time to really observe your horse in their surroundings and feel the vibe in your barn too. Is it a barn? Is it somewhere you like to hang out? You know, because if you're not really enjoying hanging out at the barn, maybe your horse isn't really loving living there either, right? So think about that and think about the fact that horses are also not people. So what we love, just add the caveat of what we love in a barn may not be, you know, us getting there and all our friends being there and being able to chit chat for hours on end with all our friends and have loud conversations and share our day and all our stress and angst and whatever with our barn friends, we may actually inadvertently be creating an environment that's not super great for our horses. I think that's a wrap. (laughs) Is there anything else that you want to add or anything that we've discussed that you feel is particularly important or that needs to be repeated? Well, there's so much we could talk about still. It's such a big topic, but we probably should wrap it up for today. But there are a couple of things I do want to mention, which is that if your horse is on acid suppressants for a long time, it's important to remember that although we sort of demonize gastric acid, it is actually important and has a couple of really important jobs. And one of those jobs is to kill off pathogenic bacteria or bacteria that have entered the horse's digestive tract while that horse is grazing, around, licking things, putting his mouth on things. And, you know, the acid is so acidic that it will kill off any of those bacteria entering the GI tract and prevent them from getting further down the tract alive, where they might actually cause disruption to the beneficial hind gut microbial population. So if you are giving medications to treat ulcers for, you know, a period of time, especially if it's a long time, you've got those glandular gastric ulcers and you're treating horses for several months, I do think it's worth providing some hindgut support as well. And we do have uh, an entire episode on pre, pro and postbiotics. That was episode 29. So I'd encourage our listeners to go and listen to that. And then the other thing that I think is really important to mention is that there are companies out there making some pretty wild claims about their products and healing ulcers, destroy ulcers, defeat ulcers, these kinds of things guaranteed to work in 24 hours or if it doesn't work, your money back. I mean, great. If it doesn't work, your money back. That's not a bad thing, right? For those of us owning horses doing these things. But Nothing is going to cure ulcers overnight. That is a fallacy. And I hope we made that point last time talking to Dr. Phoebe. Like, it's just not possible to heal gastric ulcers that quickly. And unless you are an FDA approved drug, you are not allowed to make claims of treating, preventing, curing, any of those kinds of things. 
to do with any kind of medical condition. Like if you're claiming that you can treat something, prevent it, cure it, that is a drug claim. That is like a drug as we think of drugs, like pharmaceutical type drug claims. And for drugs to be able to make those kinds of claims, they've been through very stringent FDA approved trials. And they've had to prove to the FDA that they really can do what they say they do. And then they are allowed to make those claims. Supplements fall under, yes, supplements in the eyes of you know the FDA are in fact drugs, but they are only allowed to make what are called structure function claims. And so you can make a claim such as supports a healthy gastric environment, helps promote a healthy stomach environment, those kinds of things. You cannot say treat, cure, or prevent. Those are drug claims. And honestly, anytime I see any product making an outright claim, it immediately goes on my no-go list. Like it might be a great product, but if you can't play by the rules, I'm not going to recommend you. And if you don't know what the rules are, then you probably shouldn't be in the marketplace. And, you know, I'm not interested in really recommending products where companies haven't done their homework, don't know what the rules are, and are making claims they shouldn't make. Similarly, you know, you're really not supposed to even use the word ulcer in your product name title, because that is a direct suggestion that you are going to prevent or cure that condition. So you're really not supposed to use, you know, medical conditions in the names of your products. That's kind of a no-go as well. So I steer clear of any products that make such claims because they are, in fact, illegal. For our listeners, if you'd like to be a part of our conversation, please send your suggestions for future topics and equine nutrition questions to info at scoopandscale.com and is spelled out. You can also find Claire at clarityequine.com. If you've enjoyed this episode, we'd be thrilled if you'd share it with your friends on social media and be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. For the Scoop and Scale podcast, I'm Jill Jackson. And I'm Dr. Claire Tunis. Thanks for riding along with us. 